Let's look to the word of the Lord tonight, the book of 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. There are very few chapters in the Bible that make as much sense or more by reading them backwards. Starting at the last verse in the chapter and reading up backwards. Very few chapters in the Bible can be done that way. But John chapter 1 is one of those. It makes almost more sense to read it backwards than it does forward. And I'm going to do that tonight, beginning with verse 30. Verse 10, rather. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. Verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 4, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. And I want to use for my thought tonight, of course we couldn't possibly touch base with the verses I just read, but I've got, I've got to just narrow this thing way down. Verse 6, if we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. And I will use this for thought, if we walk in the light. Heavenly Father, we're thankful again to be back in your house and how our hearts were blessed this afternoon how you just came and helped us in the communion service. And the great crowd that was here for that was just amazing. We pray that tonight you'll come and help us as we speak not only to the young people, but to us older ones as well. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Who needs to learn to walk in the light? We think the kids do. We think they're already in the light. They've been in our home their whole life. They've watched us. They've seen the saints. They know they've got light. Well, let me just tell you something tonight. A young person's just like everyone else. They come into their own light in their own time. And you cannot push them into it just as nobody pushed you into the light. We have to be patient with the young people and allow them to walk in the light they have and then into the next plane of light and the next and the next. And so we've got to be careful about judging our young people and uh, let them get their own light. Let them get that settled on their own at an altar of prayer. And, and we can't let our parents' standards be ours even though they are the right thing. I want my children to walk in the light that I preach. I wrote my daughter a letter Really, it was a book she gave me. And I don't know, it was like kissing butterflies or something like that. I, I forget. And uh, it asked a million questions, and you were supposed to go in there and tell the answer to all these questions. So I, before she got married, I thought, well, you know what, I found the crazy book. And I thought, you know what, she gave me this. I think it's nonsense, but I'm going to do it. And as I began to write that book, I just began to weep. I, I realized God the Holy Ghost was going to use that book to help me convey my feelings toward my daughter on, on her marriage day. And I wrote that book, and uh, I think it was 160 pages. And uh, I said in the end, Krista, never stray far away from the way you've been raised, and you'll make me a happy dad. She told me after they got home from their honeymoon, she said, on our honeymoon, we had a long flight and I read the whole book. And she said, Dad, I cried while I read the book. And I wanted her to know that she had all kinds of room to grow on her own, but not go too far from how she'd been raised. Again, I talked to the older people 
There are people here tonight that haven't been saved as long. You may not have been saved very long at all, or maybe you're not saved at all tonight. I have something to talk to you about as well. How is light revealed to us? You say, well, what is walking in the light? Well, I know what it is to walk against light. If we had a great, big, huge spotlight tonight sitting right where I am, and you were at the back door, and that light was so huge and so bright and so big that that's all you could see, you were headed toward the light, you were headed toward the light, and there was a huge hole, there was a, a great big bunch of uh, brambles, there was barbed wire strung, piano wire strung, all kinds of stuff. You would be so blinded by that light that you would fall into that pit, you'd fall into that broken glass, you'd fall into the barbed wire, the electric wire, the piano string, and the whole business. But when you're walking in the light, if you were up here starting that way and the light was here and you were walking in the light, you'd miss the barbed wire, the piano wire, the pit, the thorns, the glass. You understand what I'm saying? You may not know what it is to walk in the light right now, but I tell you, you know what it's like to walk against light. It's been one pitfall after another. It's been one stumble after another when you walk against God's light. What is God's light? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Light is not the, the membership book of the God's Missionary Church. I've never seen it. I don't know where it is even. I'm, there's not one up here anywhere. You see, we're not as in, much interested in membership at Beaver Town as we are in you knowing that you're a child of God. At such a place and such a time, if God leads you to be a member of this church, I'm sure there's some committee somewhere that will meet with you and discuss the manual of the church with you and go over all of that. But that is not, we're not in a hurry for that. We're in more of a hurry to know that you have everything settled in your heart and you're ready for heaven. You may never join the church here. You may just attend here the rest of your life. And that's okay. Not everyone will feel pleasant about joining a church. Not everyone will feel like they can join the church, that they could, and somehow in their heart they think, oh, we could never meet the standard of the church here. But yet I think there's not a soul here that can say, that you are never, have never felt unwelcome here. There were people at communion today that possibly will never join the church, but they were more than welcome at communion. And that's what a church is. Everyone doesn't see the light at the same time, and some people never see the same light you do, let me tell you. I've had people that tell me if I leave my tithe off, off, they'll call me for a meeting. And I say, no, that's not my light, that's yours. If I'm coming, I'm wearing my tie. I was taught in the church of Nazarene, wear a tie or you were sloppy. How could I go against what I've been taught? Somebody else sent me and said, oh, we want you to come, but if you wear a tie, it has to be black, brown, or gray. I wrote them back. I said, I can't come. I wear my same ties to all my meetings. None of them are loud, but that's just who I am. I, I'm not walking in your light. I'm walking in my light. I have respect for people's light. I don't care how much light people have that they're sweet about it. But some people feel like they've attained and their hands on the light switch. And bless God, when they flip the switch, if you don't jump, you're not even saved. I'm against that sort of thought. How is God's light given to us? First and foremost, God's light is given us through his word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How is God's word brought to us in light? How is light brought to us? Through the Holy Spirit. There are some things that are revealed to us directly from the Holy Spirit himself. It's never been mentioned from the pulpit. You've never stumbled across it in scripture. But suddenly the Holy Spirit just reveals to you, oh, you probably shouldn't do that. 
we had a new convert in our church and I just saw her recently. And she, she said, Brother Mitchell, I heard you give my illustration. She said, you got it all right, wrong, but one point. Uh, got it all right, but one point. She said, I want to straighten you out on that. She was happy I gave the illustration. I'm going to tell it correctly tonight. She, uh, when she first got saved, she got up one night. She said, well, I feel like I just need to praise the Lord. She said, last Sunday, she said, uh, we had people coming to uh, do something to the house. And, and I felt like we needed to get our trim painted uh, before uh, they came. And she said, I felt like, you know, it's Sunday, but, you know, I just think we need to do this and so on. And she said the next morning when she got up, the paint was all on the ground. And God said, don't do that again. Hello? And she got up and told the crowd, she said, guess what? I won't be painting on Sunday anymore. Nobody preached that. She didn't read that in the Bible. Thou shalt not paint thy trim upon Sunday. <laughs> the Holy Ghost revealed that to her. And all of you will have times that you will be somewhere doing something and the Holy Ghost will say, no. One girl was in Walmart, and before I quit going to Walmart, I'm celebrating my fourth year into my fifth of not going to Walmart. I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you say, why don't you go? Because I just don't want to go there. I want to go to the little guys. I want to buy my stuff from the little guys that made America great. Walmart didn't make America great. It made America awful. Sorry, Walmart. But I've been very happy walking in the light. My wife has refused to walk in the light. <laughs> she still dares to go, but never when I'm along. She sneaks and does it. <laughs> you see, how I feel about Walmart isn't how she feels about it. I felt like they thought they were the, the, uh, the Justice Department of America during COVID. They put lines on the floor that told me what way I could walk. They ran old people clear to the corner of their building that could barely get out of their car and made them freeze in line and then stood there and click, 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 click. They let people come into their store with underpants on their face. <laughs> oh, sorry, rabbit trail. Some things are revealed to us directly from heaven. Some things are revealed to us during the preaching or the singing. Amen. One night we were in a meeting and we sang the song that says, life started out like a canvas and God started painting on me and I took the paintbrush from Jesus and painted what I wished to see. The colors I painted kept running and the objects were all out of size. I had made a mess of my painting. My way now seemed so unwise. So I brought my painting to Jesus. All the colors, all the pieces so wrong. In the markets of earth, it was worthless. But his blood made my painting belong. He worked with so much compassion. Never mentioned the mess I'd made. Then he dipped his brush in the fountain and signed it. The price has been paid. When I gave the brush back to Jesus... When I gave the brush back to him, he started all over life's canvas to fill. When I gave to Jesus the brush of my will. That's what we sang. And that night, a lady came running to the altar during the song. And others came running to the altar. I mean, God used that song. And so we were going from one to another. We came to her and she said, oh, Brother Mitchell, when you started talking about the brush... She said, oh, the Lord showed me my makeup brush. Huh? That is not what that song is about at all. But God used that song to show her that she was full of vanity. He says, everybody that picks up a makeup brush full of vanity, I will not be the judge of that tonight. Some people, I'm almost wondering if they shouldn't pick it up. I've met some people that I thought I'd be horrified if they didn't have something on. And I'm not, I'm not preaching against uh, you putting a little bit of something on your nose to hide that big pimple you've got. I, you know, I don't go to those. I don't go there. 
But I just want you to know, God uses little things in different ways to touch people. I could have got up and preached on makeup, jewelry, and paint in the barn. I remember hearing the old timers saying, you know, some of you are still painting the barn. You know, I've heard all kinds of things. But that song touched her heart that night and did something no one else could have ever done and show her her vanity. Your makeup brush may never show you your vanity, but hers did that night because that song showed it to her. Are you listening? The testimony of the saints brings light. Now I've seen some saints take this to heart and they would get up and say, well, bless God. When I got saved, I went out and bought a razor. Oh. Just a. A fellow came walking in one day to a new convert who had a beard and said, I guess you know what to do with this. And I thought, give me it. I know what to do with it. Take the blades out of it and cut your head off. In the love of Jesus. <laughs> what? Do you mean to tell me that someone who's just started coming to church needs a lesson from you about whether or not they should have hair on their face? God forbid. You see, we've done a lot of dumb things in our midst. And that's why there's a lot of people that hate us. Because we've done dumb things. Let God show the light. If God doesn't want them to wear a beard, then fine, let God show them that. Who am I to decide that? I knew a lady that judged everybody that wore sandals. She thought it was so unchristian, so ungodly, so worldly. I don't know where your stand is on that tonight. I'm getting in the woods already. And so this lady had made such a big thing of this. She would go to people in the church and tell them things about that. And so one night I, I went and sat down by her at a camp meeting and I said, Hey, if I could show you in the Bible where God commanded the disciples to wear sandals, would you change your mind on the issue? She said, you can't and I won't. I said, give me your Bible. And it says, Jesus commanded his disciples to be shod with sandals. She said, I'm not going to do it. I said, wait a minute now. Jesus commanded you to. I'm not going to do it. You see what I'm talking about? I don't have sandals either. I have Crocs. <laughs> so much more modest. You can only see it after sunshine in the garden, just spots on the tops of my feet. I'm so much more old fashioned than you. Let me tell you something. My mother worked in the garden barefooted my whole life. Don't give someone else light. It's not your place. But if in a testimony, a true testimony of a dear saint of God who's not intending to pull out an arrow and shoot at somebody, something comes up and someone in the crowd says, oh, I ought to do that. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. That's what I need to do. That's what I'm talking about. Songs. That's why we need the hymnal. That's why you need the hymnal. Amen. You need to get rid of some of your CDs that are just worthless trash. They're written by people who probably don't even know God. There's more beat and bang to them than there is scripture. Hello. Get you some, get you some good old fashioned music to put on your little stereo in your car, in your eight track player. And if you don't have eight track, get you some good cassettes to listen in your cassette player. And if you don't have that, if you're, 
if you're so unfortunate that you don't have those two things. If you have a CD player, get you some good CDs. If you're so unfortunate you don't have those, get you some MP3s. Get a little cigarette lighter thing that you plug in that has songs on it. What do you call that? USB? USB. I got a USB of somebody just playing the hymns. My wife says, honey, can we listen to something else for a while? I said, no. No. These hymns feed me. And then sometimes I'll say, yeah. Boom, out goes the one in it that has the words with it. The first one is just music. The second one is words too. And then once in a while I give in and let her play the Collingsworths. Because I, I can still get blessed when I hear that. I go to their concerts when somebody else pays my ticket. <laughs> but you see, you need to be reading good books. Because there's other books besides the Bible that have been written by good people that God will use to shine light on your path. And you can get blessed by those books and light will shine on your path. The light of God is somewhat like the sun's light. And let me illustrate that to you. Early in the morning, and some of you will never understand this because you never wake up this early. So this illustration means nothing to you. But in the earliest part of dawn, if your window shades are up, real early in the morning, you can open your eyes and across the room you can make out the dresser, the chest of drawers, whatever you call those. And you say, oh, there's, there's the chest of drawers and then there's the outline of the bathroom door. Yes, there's the bathroom. The outline of the door to the kitchen, yes. The floor lamp. Yes. As the light gets a little brighter, you realize that you hung your jacket on the chair the night before. And you realize for the first time, oh no, I've got to hang that up before she sees it. That's one of your first thoughts. And then you realize too that your, your shoes are under the chair too because the light's getting brighter. You see the picture on the wall that came from grandma. You see the clock, but you can't read its face yet. The light's getting brighter. And the brighter the light, if you lay there long enough and the sun gets up just a little better, you can, you can begin to see the things on the chest. You can see the top edge of your pocket knife. You can see your, your billfold out here, your wallet, on top of the chest of drawers. You can see the vase. You can see it says 40th anniversary on it. And you know, if you were to lay there a long time or come back in the room later and the sun was pouring through the window, you would see dust on that furniture. Yeah. You say, oh, my house is always clean. No, it's not. Oh, no, it's not. There's dust on everything in your house. When the light comes in at a certain angle in the afternoon, you can see it in the air. And beforehand, you couldn't see it at all. One day, a bunch of kids were at our house. Rachel, I don't know if you were there. A bunch of kids were at our house, and kids, they, I'd tell them, I am going to take a nap. I don't want to hear a word out of you guys. I would threaten them. Then I would go upstairs to my room. But one day, I heard a commotion, and I went down. We had a 1930s mohair couch and chair. Don't laugh. And those kids, somebody had plopped down on the couch and out came a billow of dust particles that was coming through the southernmost windows of our house. And our, house, our windows are 86 inches high. And there are three of them on that side of the house into our great room. Our house used to be a church. And when that cloud of dust came out of that couch, they all started laughing. And one of them slapped one of the arms and up comes a cloud. And somebody slapped their chair they were sitting in and up come a cloud. And then they took the pillows that were in the corner and banged them together like cymbals and up came a cloud. 
And they were screaming and shouting and laughing and I, I didn't know what was going on and I came downstairs and I said, what, what, who, who's in the room? The room was full of dust particles out of that old mohair couch. They had lain there undisturbed until the light got bright. And that's what happens in your life. Many things go undisturbed in your life for years. And then all at once the light shines and you say, oh, wow. Wow, I didn't know that was that way. That's light. Oh, boy. In this same manner, God reveals to us one thing after another that is his will. And we are finally announced and asked by God to renounce things that we once didn't see were wrong. You see an old sinner out there and he just thinks, well, if I could just quit drinking and swearing, I think I'd be doing good. And I've heard old guys say this to me before. I think, preacher, if I could just quit drinking and swearing. And I'd say, well, come on down. Come on down and see. It's morning. And he's coming down to the church and he's a drinker and he swears openly. But he's coming down into a pale light. And he, he realizes if he could just quit drinking and sinning. Just quit drinking and cursing that maybe he could fit in the church. That's how, what little light the man has. And later, as he repents, the scales begin to fall off his eyes and he sees not only his liquor habit and his cursing habit, but he realizes he's been very dishonest and he's vulgar. The song comes to me tonight it was down at the feet of Jesus, oh, the happy, happy day when the light first dawned on my spirit, when my sins were washed away. The light first dawned on my spirit is the key to that song. The light dawns on his spirit. He realizes he's the chiefest of sinners and he's converted. And he says, you know, I think maybe we should pray at meals. And his wife is shocked. And he bows his head. He doesn't know what to say, but he's going to pray at the meals. His children are shocked too. And then the Lord reveals to him that his chewing tobacco is not pleasing to God. And those brown stains coming down each side of his mouth don't look good on prayer meeting night. And he says, well, Lord, you can have my tobacco, chewing tobacco. And a little later, the Lord said, now, you know, you're doing good, but that old pipe, that old pipe, that cherry tobacco, it just isn't pleasing to me. And he says, okay, Lord, I give you my pipe. He's getting into the light, you see. And then he gets ready to go to lodge night. And he goes to lodge night and everybody in there is doing everything God has shown him that isn't good. And he, he feels out of place at lodge night. And the Holy Ghost says, really, you don't need to go to lodge night now. You have a new family. You have a new name your record book's in. And he quits going to the lodge. And other haunts that he'd been used to going to suddenly doesn't feel right there. He feels a check about going there and he quits going. What's happening? He's walking in the light. The things he's been watching on some media, he says, whoa. The Holy Ghost says, oh, what was that? And he says, oh, Lord, that isn't good. No, I won't watch that now. Hello, he's walking in the light. The music he's been listening to. Nothing like a good old country song. But the Lord says, you know, that's the music that you used to listen to. That when you play it backwards, you get your dog back, your wife comes home to you. 
you get your kids back. Because if you play it forwards, that's the order that everything goes in. He realizes that that music just doesn't fit with how he feels now. And so he, he says, Lord, okay. And then the Lord says, you know, when you go down and gamble on the horses, that just really isn't my will for you. You say, he, why didn't God reveal that to him when he talked to him about the pipe? He couldn't take it all then. Folks, I want to tell you, God knows what people can take at a time. He's patient with you. He's long suffering to us word. One thing at a time, God begins to show this old gentleman how he should live and what he should do. And it isn't long till his struggle for gold comes up. And the Lord says, oh, you love your money awfully well. When the offering plate comes by, you look for the smallest bill in your billfold. And I've given you so much. And he suddenly realizes that he is a stingy person. That he's not giving God the glory with his money. And he says, Lord, I will, I'll give. Some time ago, we had a couple that began watching our service. Where I was pastoring. And, and what she did, she just typed in the word Wesleyan. And up come our church. And they watched. And her husband said, these people are crazy. But she knew better. Because at one time she had been an old-fashioned holiness lady. And she had lost out with the Lord. And married this man during those years. And, and he had never heard of holiness. never heard. But she got hungry for God. And she knew, where to, she knew where to go. The last place she knew God was the Wesleyan Church. And she, she was looking for God. So she typed in Wesleyan. That's one reason you need to have something in your name that really means something. Some people call their church La Fontaine. That means the fountain. Well, if somebody gets hungry for God, they're not going to, they're not going to type in La Fontaine. <laughs> the name of your church is supposed to mean something. Thank God for the God's missionary church. It means something. It lets people know what you stand for. That you believe in missions, that you are God's. That you're part of the church triumph, and it means something what the name of your church is. They started coming. And uh, after they'd watched for four months, finally he says, you know, these people may not be as crazy as I thought. He said, let's go down in person, just pop in on them. And they popped in. And they never missed another service. And he came to the altar and God gloriously saved him. He knew nothing. And finally one day she says, you know, honey, he said to her, he said, you know, I heard Brother Mitchell say something about tithing. He said, what in the world is that about? And she, in her wisdom from her past, knew how to explain how when God blesses you, he wants you to give him a part back to him in thanks for what he's blessed you with. It's called tithing. There are people that don't believe in it, but I do. He said, well, what does that mean? She says, well, generally, most people feel that 10% is a good number. He said, huh? She said, yeah. You know what he did? He went away from the conversation a little bit miffed. I didn't know about this till later. A couple Sunday mornings later, he slipped her his billfold. And he said, honey, it's all God's. Just put in whatever you want to. It's all God's. Who showed him that? I hadn't, I hadn't been preaching tirades on giving. Oh, I want to sometimes. I'm always in the receiving mood. I like to raise money. I love to raise money. My favorite thing to do. 
What's happening? People are getting in better light. And then some will say, they're getting fanatical. Hmm. The person's very happy minding the spirit. They're getting along great. And then somebody comes and says, you're fanatical. But the people who cry fanatic have put a limit on God's spirits leading in their own life. They put the lid on the light. They've said, you know, I've just got all the light I need. Down draws the window blind. And they are upset with people who continue to get light when they have stopped getting light. And they cry fanatic. They put a limit on the spirit's leadings. They become satisfied where they are. And they stop growing in grace. You say, well, you can go too far. Really now? Do you mean to say that you can get too much light from God? Let's talk about that sometime. For everyone who does, if there is a place such as that, and I'm not talking about the people who make up stuff and call it light. Hello. I know people who are against purple tennis shoes. Okay? I'm just for, for instance right now. I'm talking about true light from God. For everybody that you think has gone too far, there are thousands who have never gone far enough. They've never allowed the Holy Ghost to lead them into holiness. They've been around the Holiness Church their whole life and have never gone into the second work of grace. They can't testify to it on Wednesday night. They still throw fits from time to time. And the devil says, well, you know, you can't get rid of that. Yes, you can. You need to walk in the light. The light of God will lead you unto, into holiness. Amen. It's getting quiet. It's 15 till 9. And I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up right now. You know, God can eclipse everything that we thought in the past was grand and glorious. The mountain peaks of yesterday can be our valleys of the future. Some are afraid that they'll become extremists and they get nowhere. There are danger points that light brings to you. There's a danger that you will disobey because others you know that are professing do the things God's calling you to stop doing. You listening? You say, well, sister so-and-so does that. Why would you ask me? It's not God's business to deal with you the same way he does sister so-and-so. He knows her heart. One guy said, I was climbing over the fence and my tie got caught on the fence. And the Lord said, don't wear a tie. Harry Plank said, I'm glad he didn't get his pants caught in the fence. I like to quote people that say great things. I don't like to steal thunder. You know, some people profess, and you know, I want to have confidence in everybody, and I try to. I don't care how radical you are if you're sweet about it. When I get called in meetings, you wouldn't believe some of the places I get called to. I get preached at all day long. It's camp meetings where it's just one thing after another that, you know, is going on. And I'm like, whoa, how did I get here? How did I get here, Lord? And then I get up to preach. I got up, one guy preached on not going to Applebee's, okay? And I mean, they shouted, ran the aisles, Holy pandemonium broke out. The next night I preached on heaven and they just sat and looked at me. <laughs> and finally I said, folks, there's just something wrong with this. You're more excited about what you're not doing than what you're fixing to do. There's something wrong with that. But then I've been with real radical people and their sweetness overpowered me. And while I was there, we became very good friends and they said, Brother Mitchell, you have a message we need to hear. 
And that's why we've invited you to come. And their sweetness radiated upon me until I knew they loved God. They were much more radical than I'd even considered in the past till I met them. And I thought, oh, where have I landed? But when I left, I said to my wife, oh, those are some of the sweetest people I have ever met. It doesn't matter to me how radical you are if you're sweet about it. Now, it matters to me how worldly you are. But it's not for me to judge you. I'm supposed to be sweet toward you too. Because you may not be doing what I think, but I'm supposed to use that same attitude and sweetness towards you. Because you may not know what I know, and you may never know what I know, and you may enter in ahead of people that know more than you. Hello? There's people that don't know hardly anything, but they're going to heaven. I've met people that didn't have a thimble full of brains. And I think they're going to be in heaven. See, is it me? If that's what you just thought, it probably is. <laughs> There's a danger of getting new light and discounting and denouncing others who aren't walking in your new light. New increased light will bring more joy to you and more victories. Don't close yourself up. The songwriter said, I've opened up toward heaven all the windows of my soul. I've raised every window blind in my heart. I'm ready for the sun just to shine in. That's what that song says. I'm a living on the hallelujah side because I got all my window blinds up. Don't be happy to produce 30 fold when you can produce 60 or 90 or 100. When we walk in the light, we have sweet fellowship with the saints. There's something about the saints. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. The blood just keeps cleansing as we walk in the light and we love one another, even those we don't agree with, we still love them. Proverbs 4 says, The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more until the perfect day. But the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Let's stand together. Our singers are on the platform and just anything where you want to play, sing, whatever you want to do. And this isn't the kind of night that we're just going to hold on and on and on and just try to, be we're begging everybody to come to the altar. We've had great altar services already. But I want to ask you something tonight. Is there something that you feel perhaps the Holy Ghost is leading you to do that you just haven't taken the step? You've been a little rebellious about it. You've been kind of holding back. And you just want to come to the altar and say, God, you, you've spoken to me about this and you may not speak to my friend in sitting beside me about it or, or anyone else in the church, but you know me, you know my tendencies, you know how this is going to affect me down the road. And if this is what you want me to do, then I want to walk in that light. Some people have promised God they were going to do things in a moment that wasn't really the right time. They heard somebody preach real hard on a subject and they came to the altar and said, God, I'll never wear red tennis shoes again. And then down the way, they grow in grace. And the Lord says, you know, it wasn't your red tennis shoes I wanted. It was you. And so later on, you'll see them playing basketball at the church functions with their red Nikes on and it's all still okay because in the, in, the, in, the, in the midst of it all God got what he wanted he wanted them and after he had them the red Nikes weren't a problem anymore there's going to come a time in your life when the little things you think don't matter now are going to end up being the stepping stones to you getting to the place God wants you to be and as we bow our heads tonight while they sing we're going to ask you to come if you have a need. If the Holy Ghost is working tonight, just come.